everybody. Um, so uh, I'm a faculty member in the College of the Department of Education at St. Oval College, um, but I also wear a couple of other hats, and one of those is uh, I'm the director of something that we're now calling the Commons for Full Spectrum Learning at the college. We used to call it the Digital Learning Initiative, but we grew up and we grew into something else. And uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what that is and how that framework has grown into something that has allowed us to start to shift our institution to uh, new ways of teaching and learning uh, that elevate, elevate student learning. And so uh, my colleague, uh, Autumn Haynes, we just ran a, a conference similar to this in St. Albert yesterday. I was there in the morning uh, and uh, had lunch and heard some great student speakers. We brought in DeRosa for the keynote in the morning and then jumped on an airplane and came here. Um, but she was uh, managing the conference, so she's still there. <laughs> so this is my colleague, Autumn Gaines. So Autumn, you want to say a word about your background? Yeah, hi everyone. My name is Autumn Keynes and I'm an instructional designer here at St. Rupert College. Um, I became familiar with the full spectrum pedagogy framework and theories probably about two years ago. I ended up at St. Rupert at that very conference actually as a presenter um, and came, became familiar with the community. And then an opportunity opened up about eight months ago for me to actually work at the college. And uh, I applied and interviewed, and I actually obtained that position. So now I uh, now I get to work with it even more closely, and it's a real honor. And it's an honor to be here and be able to present with all of you today. Okay, so I'm gonna pardon me while I shift this into presentation mode, and Autumn is gonna uh, move into the background here if I can get this to work. Okay, like brilliant colors here. Um, so uh, actually, our, our model is about uh, is about color in, in the sense that we're using the concept of a uh, spectrum. Um, and so the I uh, want to just take you quickly through the history of how we got to this idea and how we're using it. So um, this is what we sit call full spectrum pedagogy as a framework for designing to help faculty situate current practice, conceptualizing the range of possibilities, and shifting the focus toward how they might use technology to enhance student engagement and learning. In other words, as we started to talk about digital learning and the place of digital learning in a small liberal arts college where we prize face-to-face interaction with one another. How could we possibly be interested in technology? Um, and some of my colleagues notably said, well, the minute you start talking about this stuff, Reed, then they're going to go, wait a minute. You can't tell me the right way to teach. I know I'm teaching the right way. And so one of the things that we came to was, it's not about getting everybody to change their teaching. We want to keep the really best of traditional teaching as part of what goes on at our college. You should have a great lecture class when you go to college, a really great lecture, okay? You should have one of those experiences. But you, you should also probably be sure to take an online course because out there in the world, most PD is done through online tools. And so you need to be able to have a sense of how that works differently how that environment works. And then every shade of that spectrum in between. So our concept was up front, we started talking about this, what if we talk about doing sort of the best of the best, the best of every shade, the best of every color, of every blend of possibility from that very traditional learning on one end of the spectrum to very innovative and creative ways of learning on the other end of the spectrum in every color in between, and that the student's experience at the college would involve getting all of that, getting that whole range, that the part of their job was not just to get content, but to have those different pedagogical experiences. 
And some of those are baked into different kinds of courses and different kinds of fields, but we wanted to tease that out even more because I could walk down hallways in classrooms and see faculty standing up in front of rooms talking to students in most rooms, which told me we weren't there yet. Okay? So um, I took on the role of directing this project as sort of my side job besides being an administrator of teacher ed program and teaching, I took this job on. And so we worked to try to uh, initially do workshops and things to try to get folks involved. And the next big leap we made was twofold. One, um, we got some money. Somebody gave me a budget. It wasn't very big, but I had some money to be able to do some seed grants to be able to give out to people to try some stuff. Second thing was, we had to define what we meant by blended learning, because the definitions were all over the map. Okay, so we decided rather than grabbing onto somebody else's definition, we gotta figure out what it means for us. So I was charged with leading that effort, and this is what we came up with. Again, reflecting a full spectrum, the idea was that uh, in order to define uh, what we mean by student learning, right, that we want students to be engaged in different ways, right, and that that's really what faculty want to talk about. They want to talk about student engagement. How do we get them moved in? Right? We don't want them to be passive learners. We want them to be engaged learners. What does that look like? Okay. So there's examples here, different ways. Again, you can be an engaged learner in a really good lecture, right? I'm not saying you can't, but let's be fair. Everybody's not a great lecture, okay? We all know that, right? So maybe there are other ways to do things, right? So I know in my institution, my kids went to St. Norbert, and I said, there's a philosophy professor who uses the Socratic method masterfully. You must take this class. Because right? they need to have not just the content of philosophy, but they need to have that experience of learning in that way. That was valuable. Okay? So we're thinking about how do we situate blended learning in this context. We define blended learning then as being, well, not fully online. And then in terms of what the blend was, is you had to give up some proportion of your class time to students. That is, you weren't meeting face to face, you were doing something else online in some digital format to try to engage students. Didn't say how much, so it could be high touch, it could be low touch, there's no percentages involved. It's just you're giving up some time that fit in our definition of blended learning. If you weren't doing that, we called it engaged learning. You can be engaged learning with technology without giving up your time. That's still good, okay? But not the same thing in blended learning, okay? Um, so we're trying to build that language into the culture of the college, and, and again, doing workshops, offering seed grants. And part of our, our success came from the fact that I was able to build a team of folks that helped me or worked with me at the right level. That is, to make things change institutionally to move the needle, I need support. It can't just be me. It's got to be my colleagues, too. So uh, Autumn works in academic technology. Uh, and so the director of academic technology is on my team. The director of faculty development, who does a lot of oriented, new faculty orientation and other kind of workshops, is on my team. And the director of the library, a critical person on my team. And then also the Office of Institutional Effectiveness, because if we're going to change things pedagogically, we need to show impact. Right? And so we want to talk about assessment. If we're going to do something different, if we're going to claim that we're elevating learning, then we better show that we're elevating learning. 
Okay? And so uh, I work with those folks to try to direct all of the things that we do. And uh, we flipped our name, I mentioned a minute ago, from the Digital Learning Initiative, which was originally a task force that then became kind of a cabal uh, because I was responsible to no one. I mean, technically I was responsible to the dean, but I was not in the college structure. I was not a committee. I was not in any other line, right? And, and the dean said that was okay. In fact, he wanted it that way because he wanted me to have the freedom to try stuff and try to see change. Actually, it was a pretty, pretty smart move. Um, but we learned along the way, as many of you may have who are trying to do innovation in your institutions, that you can you get the low-hanging fruit, right? The people who are interested, who either come out of grad school and they're younger and they already know this stuff, or sometimes they're full professors who don't care anymore, and they don't care what people think, so they're just going to try stuff, right? Uh, and so you get that sort of coalition of the willing, you know, it's 20%, 25% maybe, uh, of the folks, and, they, and we've given them grants, or we have type two grants where they can go off and, and do presentations about pedagogical changes that they've made, uh, or write a paper or something, and we give them supports in that way. But we, that's not enough to move the needle, I mean, that's only, getting us to the starting line. And so we had to think about how might we uh, take things to the next level. So the change of name really has a lot to do with trying to make that effort to move things farther. Okay. And so uh, we had used the concept full spectrum pedagogy because the focus had been on faculty. How can we get faculty to, to adjust their pedagogy to elevate student learning, right? Makes sense, okay? But we decided to expand to talk about full spectrum learning. So full spectrum pedagogy is part of that, but we're talking about learning generally. That is that we're saying that across the breadth of the college experience, students learn in a variety of places, in a variety of ways. We need to capture all of that um, and facilitate all of that. Okay, so we changed the name to Full Spectrum Learning, and then the Commons piece is just a little side note. It was the center for Full Spectrum Learning, but when we got a new president. He came from another institution and he said, you know, I don't know, really know about centers. You know, we may have too many centers and I'm not sure there's any accountability for centers and all that. And so we said, oh, what are we going to do? We were just going to make this center. I found this on the web. And now, we, now he's saying, <laughs> your president's saying centers. Well, he's not sure about centers. I don't want to invest in that. So we were saying, well, but if we're talking about students and we're talking about everybody working together to facilitate learning, what if we went back to the idea of commons and saying that it's about us all collectively working together to elevate learning, not just the faculty, the staff, everybody who works at the college, the students themselves. And so that's why we changed the name. So what's in the name? Maybe a lot. Okay. Uh, the other thing we did was we took the two, uh, the levels of student engagement that I was talking about before, and we combined them with these levels of, uh, of learning in terms of what I was talking about in terms of non-digital <laughs> with fully digital with hybrid here. And notice these boxes are all blank, that's not, that's because this is something we want to give to professors and say, where do you fit? Where does this class fit? Where does this assignment fit? Just to sort of as a reflective matrix to get them to think about their own practice and where it might be situated in terms of both student engagement and their use of technology. Again, we're trying to create a vocabulary and a framework for everybody that we're kind of 
not hoisting on them, just gently nudging in their direction, yes. Um, and so that led us to this point where we are right now. And this is our new diagram. And I'm going to let Autumn uh, take over and talk about these next few slides. Autumn, we've got about five minutes. Okay, I can get through this really quickly. Can you hear me okay? Yep, yes. just tell me when you want to advance the slide. Awesome, thanks. So as we started to think about full spectrum learning and how it relates to full spectrum pedagogy, um, of course we started to focus more on the student perspective and the language of trying to blend together the curricular and the co-curricular, of course, came up and became a part of this. Another thing that came up, which we'll see in just a second here, is moving away from a focus on uh, maybe a first year experience or a capstone experience and really trying to think about and consider the entire college experience, the entire four year experience. Um, so uh, one of the things that uh, kind of lies at the center of this from a tools perspective, not from a pedagogical perspective necessarily, not from a theoretical perspective, um, but from a tools perspective is domain of one's own. And if you're not familiar with domain of one's own, really basically it's the idea that you give a student an internet domain um, and they can install different programs on it. Um, one of the simple uses is to install something like say WordPress um, for a portfolio project where they would um, uh, be able to uh, highlight some of their work. So that's sort of where we're beginning. Um, why don't you go ahead and advance the slide, Reed? Thinking about things from a little bit more of a theoretical perspective. So that's like the curricular, co-curricular tools perspective that we just looked at. But when we think about it more theoretical, when we think about it more pedagogical, we want to be thinking about the entire, um, the entire experience of the student. And at the heart of that really is the idea of student ownership and agency of their learning. Um, and that's one of the reasons why the tool Domain of One's Own fits so well is because um, at the heart of Domain of One's Own is a theory, is a philosophy of ownership and agency of the student's learning. Um, and you can see what we're trying to represent with the graphic here is the overlap. So that it's not that we're thinking about the first year in a silo and the second year in a silo and the third year in a silo, but there's overlap between all of those experiences to think about the, the entire uh, the entire experience. And then um, we're very new and very fresh in this, but uh, we do have a couple of examples of some domains that some students and some faculty have built. Those are on the slides that follow. So here we see like an early experience. Actually on the left, that's a printmaking class where the, the faculty member actually owns the domain but has uh, WordPress installed and is giving accounts to the students. Then we have actually a really simple uh, domain of one's own example where somebody's just got one page up, they do some video work on the side and they're bringing that in. Go ahead and advance the slide, Reed. Okay. Uh, here we're getting a little bit more experience. We're gaining a little bit more here. We've got a digital research fellow blog. So this is somebody who has a research fellowship at the, uh, at the institution, at the college, and they're blogging about that experience, what they're learning, what they're finding in their research, and using this as a research dissemination tool, as well as a, a sophomore student who is just blogging more generally about her college experience um, in the classroom as well as outside of the classroom. Go ahead and advance the slide, Reed. Okay. And here we're seeing stuff that is a little bit more advanced, maybe, when we're seeing fully uh, fully designed uh, portfolio sites, or in one case, even somebody who's doing uh, uh, an online business. So um, yeah, that gives you a little bit of an idea of where we're headed in the future. 